one of those amazing novels that not only garnered uh, incredible literary um, acclaim, but it then became a popular modern classic. And uh, having been a stage play, then made it to um, the big screen. Craig had quite a part in that. And it just, at the time, 11 years ago, uh, it, it just was one of those um, novels that took up all the air, but in the best possible way. So welcome, Craig. It's so lovely to have you here. And tonight we're um, going to talk about your new one, Honeybee. Wow. Uh, it's a cliche, but uh, we don't do spoiler alerts in, the, um, in this book club, but it's really hard not to do a spoiler alert for this book when the opening scene sees the main character, Sam Watson, contemplating their suicide. Do you want to tell us why you wanted to start a book with a suicide scene? Right, well, it's, it's an attempted suicide, you're right. Um, the, the story opens with our narrator, whose name is Sam Watson, and she's a trans teenager. And we first meet her late one night in the southern suburbs of Perth, when she steps onto a quiet traffic bridge, climbs over the rail and looks down at the road below with the intention of ending her life. Um, but at the other end of the bridge, there's an old man and his name is Vic and he's smoking his last cigarette and he's there with the same intentions. Uh, he's looking to end his own struggle. But the two see each other across the void and you know, that changes their fates. Uh, they meet, and Honeybee is ultimately about the relationship that blooms between the two of them and the efforts that they make to repair each other and the people who come into Sam's life and Vic's life are uh, seeking to, to accept and to understand and to support. Yeah, it's, it's a really, um, we, we read that opening scene as a family around the COVID dinner table um, and it was just so powerful, but also really hopeful as soon as Vic comes into the scene and you, you, you know, you're a consummate, uh, novelist and you've taken us over the edge. And now at the end of the first page, you're going to start to, to bring us back up. Sam is a, is a really, again, like all the characters in your books, such a raw, honest, young uh, character. I I'm interested why you choose to write your characters at such a young age. Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting question. I'm not, I'm not sure why I'm so drawn to uh, characters who are on the precipice of uh, adolescence or, uh, or in, in those teenage years. Part of me suspects that it might be that for me, at least, I think the best novels exhibit change mm -hmm. and, uh, without question, those years, are uh, often periods of transition for, for all of us, you know, things are so definitive. We're working out who we are, what our identities are going to be, where we fit into the world and why. Um, it's a period of great upheaval. It's very dramatic. Mm -hmm. Everything's happening for the first time. Uh, it, uh, events are amplified and exaggerated and, uh, and tend to be more or less kind of dramatic. And so it's, it's quite an interesting uh, time for a novelist to try to capture. Mm -hmm. um, and, and beyond that as well, I think it also, by virtue of the fact that I think when we're in our teenage years, we're looking at the world through very fresh eyes. We're looking, we're, we're appreciating what it is uh, uh, for the first time outside the protective bubble, that protective sphere of childhood. Uh, mm -hmm. And so it can often be an interesting lens through which to uh, examine and interrogate our cultural landscape. So I, I think it's interesting to, to use a voice like Sam's or Charlie Buckton's and Jasper Jones uh, to, to elucidate and explore uh, who we are and where we're at. Mm. Um, but for Sam in particular, I think, I, I feel as though I was given Sam's character by virtue of the fact that Honeybee 
uh, stems from a real event. Um, uh, the, the, the genesis, the provenance of, of honeybee uh, owes, owes, to the, owes to the fact that, that a few years ago now, um, my brother was picking up uh, my sister-in-law from the airport uh, here in, in Western Australia and he was driving her home to Fremantle. And as they crossed the Canning Highway overpass, uh, through the corner of his eye, he saw a young person who was standing on the wrong side of the rails and they were precariously poised. And so he pulled over immediately and he called the police. While my sister-in-law, whose name is Sam, mm -hmm. uh, she got out of the car and she approached this young person. And after he spoke to the police, my brother contacted me and I was at home and I was working at the office and I felt immediately connected and heartbroken and worried. And my brother continued to give me updates. So my sister-in-law, Sam, approached this young person and they talked about everything and nothing, really, uh, until uh, they volunteered the reasons why they were there. And it turned out that they were struggling with issues surrounding their gender identity. Uh, they had lost the support of their family and their friends. They'd been kicked out of home. Uh, they were alone in the world, you know, and they found themselves in a very anguished, hopeless and helpless place. And so the police turned up soon after and they were quite brusque, they were very businesslike. They grabbed this young person, dragged them over the rail and deposited them in the back of an ambulance. Uh, and my sister-in-law was kind of dismissed. You know, she wasn't required to give a statement. Uh, that was it. She just drifted away from the scene and they drove away. And in the following days, we tried to reconnect with this person. We were worried about them and we wanted to offer our support. We wanted to check in and see if they were okay. But we had no contact information, unfortunately, and they had a really common name. And so we couldn't locate them on social media or online. And so they remained quite elusive. And so for me, uh, you know, I was left with a curious situation where I had a very real concern for a very real person who had a very real and urgent predicament, but they existed entirely in my imagination. You know, I didn't meet them. I wasn't there that night. Uh, but I couldn't stop thinking about them and I couldn't stop worrying about them. And I wanted to better understand uh, the, the, the underlying forces and the pressures and the threats and the complexities that led that person to that place on that night. Uh, and so I started to listen and I started to read and I started to learn. And, you know, I was heartbroken by many of the testimonies that I encountered. Uh, and I was alarmed by many of the, the statistics uh, that, that, that came my way. Um, and, and when I'm faced with things that I don't understand, uh, the abstract notions that I wish to clarify uh, and themes that I, that I want to explore, people that I, people that I want to, to, to meet and better empathize with, my process has always been to want to write about it. Um, and, and that's how Honeybee began. It was with that young person and I suppose uh, the character of Sam in Honeybee was my opportunity to honour that person on that night. Not to tell their story uh, because their story is their own but to honour them and uh, to, to craft a narrative that was inspired by that event. It's interesting that you um, choose to use first person to tell Sam's story. And I, I want to circle around this because I suspect that's got you into a little bit more trouble over this book than uh, when you told, um, you know, the, the story in Jasper Jones and didn't tell it in first person. Was there a reason you felt you just had to tell Sam's story in her own voice? Yeah, this was always going to be Sam's story. Uh, and so it felt intuitive and it felt right. It felt instinctive that she should be the one uh, who, uh, who guides us through this, this tale. It's her story. Um, and what I wanted to focus on, uh, perhaps more than anything else, uh, is how it feels. I wanted to try to capture the emotional complexities of growing up trans or gender diverse in Australia uh, in a contemporary setting. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it had to be Sam's voice, I think, that, that gave us that intimate insight. 
Um, you know, I wouldn't describe it as trouble. Um, you know, I, I uh, you know, I anticipated that part of the conversation to emerge from me writing Honeybee would be uh, the the, com the complexity of, of of me as a cisgender author uh, presenting or illustrating an experience uh, that is outside my lived history, and I, I'm I'm sensitive to that. I, I, I acknowledge that uh, traditional media representations of uh, trans and gender diverse people have been dominated by cisgender authors, and many of those have been damaging and exploitative and harmful uh, and in many cases degrading um, and so uh, i i understand uh why there may be some caution about the fact that that i've written this story and i do feel as though a responsibility falls on my shoulders to speak to my credentials as an ally uh, but also to reassure readers that my process has been ethical and respectful and sensitive and careful. Wow. Um, in writing Honeybee, uh, I, I wanted my process, I wanted this novel to be an opportunity to, to do better. Mm -hmm. So just to just to tack back to, to Sam's voice in this story, what that required of me in, in, uh, in trying to illustrate the emotional landscape of, of Sam's experience, what that required of me because I'm uh, acutely aware that it isn't my experience and that I don't navigate the world with the same fundamental pressures and threats and difficulties as members of the trans community mm -hmm. and I recognize that that's a privilege that I have and and uh, I, I acknowledge that this is unjust and unfair what it required of me is to collect testimonies mm -hmm. to listen to people and to understand and to empathize and that's what i did uh you know i i read as widely as i could um we live in an incredible time where uh, some very brave and inspiring people uh have confided in us online have offered us their testimonies and their histories and their stories uh and so it was a matter for me of uh reading forum posts blogs websites video logs collecting stories but more importantly, I was able to connect with support networks like Transfolk of WA mm -hmm. and to meet with uh, members of the trans and gender diverse community. Mm -hmm. uh, all, of, all of whom, all the people that I met were incredibly generous, incredibly inspiring uh, uh, and incredibly kind in sharing with me the, the intimacies of their experience, uh, the, the, the difficulties, the challenges that they've faced uh, and who were incredibly kind in, in, and open in answering my many, many questions. Mm -hmm. And so it was this chorus of voices that built Sam Watson and uh, imbued her character uh, uh, with authenticity. Mm -hmm. I couldn't have written Honeybee without the, uh, th that collaboration, without the contribution of those people. Uh, and, you know, I wouldn't have written it without their enthusiasm or their support or their encouragement or their belief or their blessing. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and so that was a very, very important part of, of, uh, of bringing Honeybee to the fore. You know, mm -hmm. I, I think there should be um, uh, in, in modern writing a nuanced ethical approach to authors who are writing beyond their lived experience. Mm -hmm. And I think what underpins that is the intention of an author, the process by which they undertake a piece of fiction, um, and the execution, wow. uh, ultimately, you know, and also a recognition of privilege and uh, the works that have that have come before, uh, and uh, and uh, some of the, the some of the issues uh, that that have arisen from those that may have been problematic in those communities. Mm. And I wonder too, I, in talking um, to my sort of young peeps council um, and running, running Honey Bee by them and saying, well, you know, what is your spin on um, Craig Sylvie writing this story, this Sam story from a um, cisgender, you know, heterosexual, middle-aged, well, younger than middle-aged uh, perspective. And, and I was really 
really fascinated. One of the uh, the um, young people I spoke to, who's in um, uh, very active in the um, queer community, said, you know, if Craig had written, uh, or if, if Craig had been an actor playing a trans um, part, that's absolutely not on. But the fact that he has written a story that is generating so much discussion and in time, hopefully, um, I, no doubt you're working on the screen treatment and screenplay if, if it's not already written. Uh, his point was that you're actually opening up space, opening the crack for more trans authors, uh, actors, creators to step off the margins and onto centre stage so that we can hear those stories. And for him, it wasn't another voices issue, uh, which I, I thought I thought was an interesting spin. I'd never never thought about it like that. Uh, well, it's quite it's quite accurately put, and uh, and that that is already the the, the case. Um, you know, it, it's it's. I think it's a bit of a misnomer to suggest that that a book like Honeybee might dominate a space or displace other writers, mm -hmm. uh, because I think it presupposes a couple of things, uh, perhaps incorrectly. Uh, one is reading habits. The truth is I've heard from a number of booksellers now who have said to me that by virtue of the fact that people have connected to Honeybee, they've come back into the bookstore and they want more LGBT content. Mm -hmm. uh, they, uh, th th they're, uh, they're thirsty for more works written by members of the trans and gender diverse community and about members of the trans and gender diverse community. Mm -hmm. um, it also satisfies publishers uh, that there is an appetite for these stories. And publishing is, you know, it's trend based, it is a business. And so uh, if publishers are satisfied that there is an audience for, for these stories, then we're going to, to see uh, more resources poured towards it and more people come towards these stories. Mm -hmm. um, and beyond that, uh, you know, I, I uh, have had the great fortune in Western Australia of being able to, to do physical events and tour the, tour the book and speak with people. Mm -hmm. And we did an amazing event uh, through Rabble Books uh, here in WA, uh, which was a fundraiser for trans folk of WA. And I met a young trans writer called Dylan, mm -hmm. uh, who had felt as though, uh, there wasn't an appetite for, for trans stories and had had people in his life suggest to him uh, that he should focus on other work. And he said to me that it's heartening that the, that the response to Honeybee has been so profoundly uh, encouraging and strong that he feels satisfied that he can follow his path and, and to write stories about him. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and, 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 and people who are, uh, who are contending with and, and tackling with the, 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 the same kinds of issues, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think it can be part of a broader conversation. It's not my intention to present some kind of definitive account of growing up transgender, because if anything has uh, emerged from my research and consultation, it's that that doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. Everybody has a different story. Uh, everybody comes from a different place and has a different experience. And so for Sam in Honeybee, all I could ever do is attend to uh, Sam's very specific story under a very specific set of circumstances in a very specific time and place. Mm. Uh, and so all I'd like is for Honeybee to be uh, uh, just a humble part of a broader conversation. Mm. Um, just, just, to, just to close that out, I, I feel it's important for me to talk about Alice Shotty from Transfolk of WA because uh, she's been, uh, uh, she's been an amazing presence in, in my life. Uh, she was a consultant uh, while I was writing Honeybee um, and uh, has been uh, part of the conversation that's emerged from the book as well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, she's a remarkable uh, uh, leader. Uh, she's an inspiring woman. Um, and she said something recently on ABC Radio Perth, which, which stayed with me. And she said that um, in in times of darkness for her, in times of difficulty, uh, she leaned on and looked to the people who held out a lantern for her. Mm -hmm. And 
uh, and, it, and it meant a lot. And once she was in a place of security and safety, she felt duty bound to hold up a lantern for other people who were drifting in from, from their own dark places. Mm. And in writing Honeybee and in speaking to Alice, Alice held up a lantern for me. Mm. And it's my earnest and sincere hope uh, above all else that Honeybee can be a lantern for, for somebody else. Mm. That's interesting because it's, it's almost a funny um, a comment that you're making on the, the experiences that Sam goes through. Who, for those um, who, who haven't read Honey Bee, she obviously has um, lantern bearers in her own life, but she's got some pretty toxic people in her life as well. So I don't quite know how, I don't want to name and shame the characters uh, in Honey Bee, but let's, uh, let's maybe have a chat about her immediate family. Um, you've painted some goodies, and some baddies, and some fabulously complex characters, and I'm a mother, and I really, um, this was a hard book for me to read as a mum, I have to say, in a really good way. It was a book that I don't think I really wanted to read, but I'm so glad I did because I learned a whole lot about being a mum. What do you think Sam's mum learns about her relationship with Sam throughout the book? That's a really interesting question. No one's asked me that. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting because Sam's mum, who is called Sarah, um, you know, she is an inconsistent, uh, volatile character. Sam has a, a childhood that you could probably best describe as neglectful. Um, you know, it, it's insecure in the sense that uh, uh, they're moving from apartment to apartment. Uh, the, there's financial difficulties. Um, she's inconsistent, Sarah, with her love for Sam. She smothers Sam with love and overwhelms her with it and then retracts it uh, and then vanishes, quite literally, uh, leaving Sam alone and isolated for great tracts of time. And for kids, this is very confusing. Uh, it's, uh, uh, it's, and they'll often blame themselves. You know, they wonder what they've done wrong. And it's, uh, you know, to have that kind of inconsistency in your life, uh, it, it, it leads to self-doubt and, and self-loathing. But it, what it also does, I think, for Sam at least, is generate this kind of toxic loyalty. Um, Sam's life, Sam's early life, is reduced down to this orbit that she has around this woman who, uh, who is just quite inconsistent. Um, and so that imbues their relationship so much. Uh, it's, you know, it's, uh, it, it's, it's, borderline an abusive relationship really um and so a, a huge thread that runs through honeybee is sam recognizing that this relationship that she has with her mother is not healthy it's not sustainable and it's it's ultimately not good for her yeah. and uh she's afforded this perspective by virtue of the fact that she removes herself from that orbit and she's uh, invited into the world of people who are much more stable, right. much more secure, uh, people like Vic, uh, people like uh, the Mima Dumas, you know, Aggie and, and her family, uh, people like Peter, um, and ultimately she, uh, you know, undergoes counselling and meets someone who's, uh, you know, very straightforward and, and very sensible. Uh, and so by virtue of all these blooming relationships, she understands uh, you know what where the difficulties lie uh mm. and where she's been largely betrayed mm. in in her life and that it's not her fault no. now your question your question was whether or not sarah has a, a similar uh moment of clarity mm. and the sad truth is i'm not sure that she does um you know i don't i don't want to get too deep into the third act 
Um, but I don't, I don't feel as though Sarah has that, that same uh, degree of fresh perspective and, uh, and openness. I think she understands maybe a little bit too late, yeah. uh, you know, mm. um, which isn't to say that, that Sarah doesn't undergo her own changes um, uh, and, and that she doesn't see Sam differently. Uh, but in terms of how she then tries to uh, adjust her own behaviour, I don't know. I'm not. I'm not as uh, as confident. Maybe mm. it's interesting though because you, um, if you look at Vic at the start, well, just at the at the moment you you meet him, he's the you know if if you said now predict who Vic is going to be to Sam. I mean, obviously, initially, he's going to sort of rescue her, so to speak. But then I would never have picked that he would, would be one of, um, he, he would be so positive in Sam's life. I think, do you, do you have fun in a way, um, not manipulating your readers, but, but writing characters that are so three-dimensional that that you're able to really um, show them to us in a way that we almost they're un, some of them are unpredictable which of course is what life is like you, you, there are a whole lot of people out there that are really I think the most interesting people are completely unpredictable um, so is that a deliberate device you've used or uh, is, of course that they characters wrote themselves or well, of, of course, it's part of the artistry of, uh, of uh, presenting a novel. And so when you look at a character like Vic, who is slow to unfurl, this happens in a, in a couple of ways, I suppose. One is that uh, our view of Vic is shaped by the lens of our protagonist. So uh, we experience the story of Honeybee through the guardedness of Sam, uh, and through Sam's insecurity, uh, and it's influenced by many of Sam's past relationships and uh, intersections with older men, with people, uh, and so there is suspicion there, and we can't help but flavour the text with that, and so that influences the reader. Mm -hmm. The other thing is that Vic himself is slow to unfurl, you know, uh, he's just that kind of man. It's interesting because in Honeybee, masculinity is seen as a threat for Sam. Yeah. It's something to be feared. Uh, it almost yeah. operates as... Right, yeah. It, it almost operates as an antagonist mm. for, for Sam, for both personal, private and intimate reasons, mm. but also obviously the people that... that uh, that she's encountered in her life. Mm. However, in Vic, I always felt it was important to, uh, for him to embody some of those really admirable and positive elements of traditional masculinity. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he's, he's a provider. He's very protective. He's very consistent. Uh, mm -hmm. He's got a heart of gold. Mm -hmm. And I'm certainly not suggesting that, that women can't embody these virtues. I'm talking about traditional masculinity, you know. Um, uh, you know, Vic lives his life by this, uh, by a set of moral laws that are kind of codified in his behaviour that, uh, that overwhelm any want or desire. It's, it's, uh, it's how he moves through the world, you know. But he's not without his flaws. No. Vic. Um, we actually learn a lot about Vic uh, through uh, Vic is a widower, and uh, his departed wife's name is Edie. And we learn a lot about Vic through uh, her diaries. Sam discovers her diaries, and in those diaries, Edie describes Vic as being a rock. And in that sense, you know, it's it's true twofold. He's very consistent, he's very resilient, he's very strong, but he's also impermeable, you know. Vic is a, a, a return serviceman, he's a veteran, uh, and he suffers in silence, you know. You almost get the sense that Edie just wanted to shake Vic and, 
and and have him describe what he's feeling, but mm -hmm. he never has. You know, he suffers in silence. And so, what's interesting in Honeybee is that Sam, in her relationship with Vic, uh, draws the blood from the stone, mm -hmm. and Vic actually confides in her. Vic uh, is more honest with Sam in some respects than he was with Edie, mm -hmm. uh, despite them having like quite a beautiful love story, really. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, Vic sees Sam as an opportunity to uh, uh, con confess, uh, to describe his feelings and, and thoughts. Uh, you know, Sam is somebody that, that he in tr in implicitly trusts. Mm -hmm. uh, and so in that sense as well, it, it, it plays to theme that over time, unpredictably, we get to know more and more about Vic and we get a very, very strong sense of, of who he is. Mm. And it's interesting because, of course, having um, Sam tell the story in, in her own voice, we're, we're privy to her in the landscape. But you had to, you had to show us Vic's in a landscape. Uh, and and it's um, in the diary is, off, is often used as, as a way of doing that as a literary device. But it's interesting that it's not Vic sharing his diary, but it's Sam interacting with, you know, someone else, as you say, Evie's angle in on him. And, and I almost got the feeling that um, Vic sort of, didn't, didn't see Sam as an extension of Eddie, but almost wanted to, the, the stuff that he hadn't said, the stuff that hadn't come out. He had a, had a second chance in his relationship with Sam that he's almost, you can almost hear him saying things and doing things that he probably realises now should have happened um, before he died. But for whatever reason, he's... His sense, yeah, his masculinity stopped him um, doing and, and, and saying those things. Um, now, I have I've been a very, very bad host of the, the um, book club. I'm supposed to tell everybody that you need to be putting your questions in the chat box that uh, Craig and I will attempt to look at and answer because we're I'm I'm hogging I'm hogging all the airspace as I always do and I know lots of you um who've read Craig's book or or want to read um Craig's book um want to ask questions and here's the first question that's come in Vic sounds like someone that Craig knows well I certainly feel like I know his character um <laughs> Look, as is often the case when you're presenting a novel, um, a, a writer will blend together uh, aspects of their history, um, people that they've met, uh, uh, things that they've read, uh, elements of life that they've absorbed, plus a healthy dose of imagination to sculpt someone that feels new. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I've known returned servicemen, um, you know, I've, I've, I've known veterans, uh, I've, uh, you know, obviously encountered men uh, like Vic or certainly who share aspects uh, of Vic. However, you know, Vic is very much his own man. It's interesting to me by virtue of the fact that now I've had opportunities to, to meet uh, people who have read Honeybee, the amount of people uh, who, you know, misty eyed have told me that they have had Vicks in their life, um, that they have Vicks in their life and how much they mean to them. Uh, you know, an older mentor, someone who's very secure and consistent and safe, uh, who they can tether themselves to. Um, but look, there are elements of my life that, that bleed into stories. So for example, um, Sam goes to stay with Vic and uh, where Sam stays, is in Vic and Edie's marital bedroom. Because when Edie dies, Vic closes the door and he never goes back in to that bedroom. Mm -hmm. He goes and sleeps in a, in, a, in a separate room entirely. And inside that room is almost like a museum 
of their love and their life. And that's where Sam stays. Um, and the truth is that uh, after my grandmother died, my grandfather did the same thing. Uh, he just closed that door and for the rest of his life, he slept in a sleep out, out the back. And, you know, he wasn't an effusive man emotionally, my, my grandfather. And so that gesture always felt very profound to me. It was very loaded emotionally. Um, you know, th th it was the strongest indication that I'd ever had that, that of the depth of feeling uh, that, that he had for her. And so it always rung very loud for me. Mm -hmm. um, and so to, to adopt that and give that gesture to Vic is, uh, it's profound mm -hmm. uh, for me. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it's intimate, very personal. Mm -hmm. uh, so these are the sorts of things that a novelist will, will borrow, which will take from and then view into their text. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting that we, you know, Sam being such a um, chronologically young character, but she she could so easily um, shut off her true self and lock it away. And I, I think there are probably a lot of people in previous generations, maybe they are now, there are people now who it's too painful to confront their true self and she has the absolute courage. And I think this is, as uh, I consider myself to be a, um, a queer ally, and I, I just feel people who um, mainstream society considers to be on the margins or outsiders, they actually they they are gutsy because they're they're prepared to go to places because life makes them go to places that a whole bunch of us don't ever have the courage to do. Do you think that Sam is the most courageous character in the book? Without a doubt. Without a doubt. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, I, I'd held this view before. I'd consulted closely with, with people in the trans and gender diverse community, but there's no question uh, that I have nothing but admiration for the resilience and uh, the strength uh, and the will and determination of members of the trans and gender diverse community. Mm. Um, you know, it's, uh, it, it's, it's quite inspiring. Mm. Um, and what I wanted to focus on in Honeybee, more than anything else, uh, is in thinking about where that story came from and that person on that bridge on that night was how, how would they make it out? Mm. How does that person find a pathway towards optimism and hope, mm. uh, and it seemed to me that to, to be part of that journey um, is the importance of understanding and acceptance uh, and support and love. Mm. And I think that's ultimately what uh, what the story of Honeybee offers us a, offers us a glimpse of. Mm. Um, it's certainly the turning point for Sam. Mm. Courageous as she is, she has to be guided towards self-acceptance and love uh, and to understand, to readily understand fundamentally that she is worth working on. Mm. Um, you know, there's no question about her courage. No. Uh, there's no question about her will, uh, mm. but it was about undermining uh, the, this, the, some of these toxic strains of, of thinking that, that she'd been led down mm. uh, by virtue of the fact that uh, she hadn't been accepted. Mm. She, uh, uh, she had been made to feel ashamed mm. uh, and guilty about who she ultimately is. And mm. so the pathway out of that uh, for, for many people in the trans and gender diverse community uh, is acceptance and love and understanding. Mm. Often I imagine people come up to you in, in um, sort of live situations and will tell you, which characters they relate to, you know, they might see themselves as being Sam or as Sam's mum, whatever. Does anyone ever come up to you and tell you that they're Steve? <laughs> no, no, not really. Uh, rarely do I see people like Steve at literary events, to be honest with you. <laughs> well, true, yes. Yeah. The, I mean, the but truth is- If they went to more literary events, they wouldn't be, such Steve-like people. 
Well, that's right. I mean, for somebody like Steve, uh, fundamentally uh, lacks empathy and understanding uh, and a recognition of the, the, the complexity and sophistication uh, of, uh, of, of what it's like to be somebody like Sam. They have very rigid binary notions of masculinity and femininity mm -hmm. and anything that falls outside of that is something to be distrusted mm -hmm. uh, and uh, lampooned. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, and, and uh, these sorts of toxic notions uh, are quite common. Mm -hmm. um, it's I mean, I mean, you, abuse, really. It's, it, it, it's abuse that you're describing that you... You obviously leave it open for the for the reader to read between the lines, but yeah, it's it's been of course, yeah, yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. And so you know, to to, to my mind, um, you know, the, the the most empathetic people that you'll encounter are readers, because mm -hmm. it's what we're doing when we uh, when we unburden ourselves and make ourselves vulnerable and give ourselves over to a narrative. Mm. Um, we put our preconceptions aside mm. and we give ourselves to a story mm. uh, and it can't help but change us and enrich us. Um, and, and that's what we're doing time and time again. And it makes us more empathetic people. We more readily understand what the world is like for other people uh, and we more readily understand our own place within it and to suspend our judgment uh, and to be open to things. Um, you know, I think it's a, a really important practice to, uh, to, to invite other characters into our psyche and to, and to live as them uh, intimately uh, and, and feel, feel uh, what it is to navigate the world as somebody else. It's a very important thing to do. Uh, and unfortunately, it's quite rare for somebody like Steve to undergo a process like that. Maybe you need to start speaking to more groups of Steve-like people. Um, now, some fabulous questions coming in. Uh, right. Let me have a look and see. Uh, Jackie D wants to say, I just wanted to say thank you, Craig. Both Jasper Jones and Honey Bee are up there with the very best books I've read. Terrific stories with brilliant characters who are often flawed, but incredibly redeemable. Um, Thank you, Jackie. That's, Appreciate that's that. More of a, that didn't start with a what, when, where, or why, but I'm I'm happy to read that one out. Yeah, um, that's fine. Yeah. I love this question from Kate Folds. Could there be a sequel? Will Sarah evolve through Sam's experiences? Yeah, it's an interesting question. Um, uh, right at the moment, uh, I'm in talks with producers. Uh, about the prospect of either a film adaptation or it's looking increasingly likely that, uh, that a high-end series drama might emerge from Honeybee. Uh, so in, in that case, uh, I would be leaning towards maybe, uh, you know, if, if view, viewership and uh, uh, financing permitted, uh, that we might head into... Uh, Season uh, two. Further seasons of Honeybee, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And in that case, I think uh, following Sarah's story, following uh, uh, Sam's story, Honeybee's story will be important. Um, yeah, I, I see great potential, yeah, for, for further telling of the story. I think it's possible. And I'm interested that you say that, um, I'm so pleased to hear that uh, the possibility of Honeybee being a series, because I thought, I remember when, Jasper Jones came out and I thought, I don't even, I don't, books are always better than films in my mind, but how on earth are they, are you going to turn that into, uh, you know, first play and then, and then a film? But I don't, I don't think you could do justice to Honeybee uh, in a film. I don't know how, I mean, clearly I'm not a screenwriter, but I, I really just think, you, mm, I'll leave it at that. I'm very happy to hear that it's. I hope that it's going to be a series more than I hope that it's going to be a film. Uh, <laughs> well, I, well, I want on. to be able to inhabit that world um, for much longer, and I want all those, as you say, that incredible layering that you've done and the unfolding, which I know some people have have criticised you about and said, "Oh, you know, it's such a cliche, cliche that." 
the main character is Sam and at first you think, oh, okay, so Sam's a male. Oh, no, hang on, Sam's a woman. Oh, but hang on a sec, no, Sam is trans. So, you know, playing on that, um, that whole sense. But I just think you've got to give it time because you allowed us as readers for that all to unfold slowly if we read it over a period of time in a day if we consumed it in a day um but we do need that time to process everything that's going on and to really um understand it at, at a much deeper level so that's very excited about that now cooking obviously i'm sorry i haven't i'm not a great cook so clearly it's not a theme that i've has resonated with me um not because it wasn't well done but just lots of questions about cooking um i think this is a fabulous question i wondered about the fact that sam is so wonderful at cooking and the whole idea of cooking is caring and someone um earlier has talked about the fact that is sam such a carer because she hasn't had that from her mum and i do have to say i, I will stop calling Sam's mum, Sam's mum, I will acknowledge that her name is Sarah because my name is Sarah. Anyway. <laughs> oh, right, yeah, well. Yeah, yeah. Nothing against Sarah's. Nothing against Sarah's, no. Uh, no Sarah's nothing against Sarah's. Um, yeah, so tell us about the cooking. Yeah, they're two great questions uh, and, and, and very insightful. Um, yeah, the, the, the truth is that, as I mentioned earlier, that, that Sam in her early life lacks nourishment uh in in a in a few crucial areas uh one of which is obviously the fact that the cupboards are bare and so food itself becomes uh kind of overvalued uh and and overcompensated for um simply because uh there, there isn't much in in the house she also lacks emotional nourishment guardianship uh uh you know a, a, a clear and and present loving force in her life and so what happens is uh, by virtue of the fact that Sam is quite isolated and her main portal into the world is an iPad um, she discovers on YouTube Julia Child yeah. and you know almost immediately Sam is drawn to this woman because she's so welcoming she's so vivacious um, she's so warm that Sam just connects to this woman and feels as though she's speaking directly to her um almost you know there's such a kind of grandmotherly uh tone to julia child uh, and she's so forgiving yeah sorry to interrupt do you think that's part of it because julia child's to me is such a um stereotypical feminine woman i mean she's got she's got everything that a lot of people are trying to be you know the, the, the perfect woman of her day because she can yeah i don't know I, I i'm not sure I, I feel as though julia is almost a bit atypical in that sense you know i mean she's quite um you know she had a remarkable life she mm. was just, you know she worked for the cia uh she you know had, had a she she came to cooking quite late mm. you know she attended the cordon bleu i think in her 40s uh i think she ate fairly rubbish food before that and then discovered cooking um you know i i, I think um yeah i i think Julia Child almost transcends gender in a strange way. She's quite tall and broad and, you know, she has this very sing-song voice, but, you know, she's very, um, she is very maternal, you're right. But uh, I don't know, she's just kind of this overwhelming force of uh, kindness and, uh, and, uh, and uh, generosity. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what Sam reacts to, I think, you know. Um, she she becomes obsessed with Julia Child and connects with her so intimately that they almost have these kind of conversations together. Sam starts speaking back to her, mm -hmm. but by virtue of that obsession, uh, Sam almost by osmosis learns how to cook, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you know she knows her way around the kitchen. And as the uh, questioner uh, rightfully identifies, cooking becomes a kind of love language for Sam. Mm -hmm. uh, Sam, who a little like Vic has difficulty uh, communicating how she feels, uh, shows people her affection for them by virtue of the fact that she will present them with a meal, will cook mm. for them. If Sam loves you, she will cook for you. Mm. Uh, if, if Sam wants to be liked by you, she will cook for you. 
It's one of the very few things that Sam, uh, even in her lowest moments, uh, can feel satisfied and confident in the fact that she can cook. Mm. Um, and so it's a really important thing for, for her to latch on to. Mm. Uh, so yes, cooking is, uh, it, it plays the theme in that uh, it's, it's how Sam expresses herself, but it's also her aspiration and ambition. You know, mm. it's what Sam wants to do more than anything is mm. to, is to have a restaurant, to be a, to be a cook. Um, you know, so it plays to the dimensionality of her, of her character. And, you know, I think a lot of that does owe from her background and a lot of that does owe to the connection that she has with, with Julia Child, uh, mm. because Julia, uh, fulfills, uh, all these elements uh, that are missing in Sam's life. Mm. One thing I really wanted to ask, um, I spend a lot of time reading young adult books and, uh, I'm interested in the way books are marketed and then the way books end up being on reading lists in things, schools. And I I was fascinated with Jasper Jones, the, the take up, I mean, I'm not surprised, but I'm fascinated by the, the take up of it as, as a set text. Uh, and, you know, so many people have grown up with it. And I was talking to um, a very dear colleague of mine, um, Cecile Shanahan was very involved in Benito Rise Festival and she was talking about the fact that readers who probably studied Jasper Jones as high school students are now at the age, a generation down, of perhaps being parents themselves, not with children Sam's age, but uh, so now you've sort of almost moved on to some different issues for that, that readership. Do you find when you're talking to people now, you, they, readers talk to you about the influence you had on their lives when they were younger readers and then you're speaking to them down the track? Yeah, you're making me feel quite old, Sarah. Um, <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, that's, a, <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's, it, it's quite amazing. I mean, uh, I think, for me at least, I can't speak for everybody, but the, the books that we read in our formative years, uh, we tend to really treasure. Mm. Um, they, they go a long way towards shaping who we are and what our values are and, uh, and, and how we look at the world. And so it's a really critical time for, for us to be, to be open and, and to have our ideas shaped. Mm. Um, and so in that respect, yeah, I, uh, look, it's 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 not for everybody there are a lot of students who uh no doubt curse my name uh mm -hmm. you know by virtue of the fact they had to write many assignments and essays based on my work um but uh you know it's um it, it's it, it's an interesting thing it's it's a really privileged place uh for an author to occupy in, in somebody's life to to have written a novel that they've identified that that a younger person has identified with uh and has helped shape their life um and more often than not the, these people will continue to support your work you're almost mm -hmm. with these people uh for the entirety of their reading life it's quite mm -hmm. an it's 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 an honor and a privilege and it's something that you know i take very seriously um uh and so you know you, you I, I suppose for, for me i just want to make sure that um, if, if I'm writing a novel that could be accessible to, uh, readers of that age, that it is generous and it has sophisticated elements, uh, and that, uh, you know, it's done with great care. Mm. Um, Wendy Holland has said, great story, Craig, well done. I'm really enjoying your presentation too. Melbourne Theatre Company's production of Jasper Jones was astound astoundingly good. And the book is one of my favourites. Um, we've talked about Honey Bee being um, a film, but we haven't talked about how it would play out as a theatre production. Would you have to do it in parts, like um, Harry Potter and the Cursed Child? Yeah, look, uh, I, I mean, I, I have learned to leave theatre to the thespians. It's really yeah. not, uh, it's, um, you know, it, it's, I'm endlessly fascinated by how things are brought to life on stage. And I've had the great honor of having, you know, five or six separate, uh, theater companies bring Kate Mulvaney's script to life, uh, in separate productions, quite incredible. Mm -hmm. Um, 
and I'm endlessly fascinated and endlessly impressed of, of how, uh, how each director, how each company, uh, how each cast member can bring something new to life uh, on, on the stage out of that script. It's been quite fascinating. Mm. Um, so look, I'm, I'm um, quite bullish about the, the, the opportunities for, for Honeybee to hit the stage. I think it would be a fascinating uh, uh, creative challenge for whoever mm. it is uh, who uh, writes that stage play. It certainly won't be me. Mm. Um, yeah, you know, I've, I've dipped my toes into the world of theatre, and it's just not uh, it's it's just not a language that that uh, I can speak readily. Mm. Um, you know, I really enjoyed working in film, and uh, I, I find uh, writing screenplays as to, to be a bit second nature for me. I adore cinema, um, mm. and uh, you know, I really love writing scripts. Uh, but theatre, it's just one of those aspects of adaptation where I just need to step back still remain as a consultative voice, but mm. ultimately just delight in uh, what the expertise of the people involved can, can bring to the fore. Mm. Um, but yeah, we'll see. The, 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 the better the trajectory of the book, the, the better chances that we have of, uh, of a stage production, I suppose. So I'm ever hopeful. Mm. And I, I can imagine uh, a book like Honey Bee, which is so multifaceted and did risk I have to say, becoming an issues book, you know, how many issues can Craig Seal be stuck into there? But luckily, I, um, in my humble opinion, well and truly pulled it off. Um, but I imagine you could, you could have the most amazing suite of a season of plays of Honeybee told through different voices. Because I, I would love to, um, I would love to hear some of the, the inner landscapes of those characters um, tell for them what was going on in their relationship with Sam. Um, I think that would, that would be an interesting Yeah, that's the, that's the interesting thing about adaptation, you know, and certainly uh, uh, what really excited me about the, the prospect of writing Jasper Jones for screen, for example, is that you pull yourself out of that singular narrow uh, protagonist voice, uh, and you can actually imbue characters with extra dimension. Mm -hmm. um, so, so in Honeybee, for example, uh, when writing the, the, the screen adaptation, um, it, will, it will be about uh, presenting Vic as he truly is, not necessarily, not as, not Vic as Sam sees him. Mm -hmm. uh, it, will be, it will be Vic in his unvarnished form and we'll be able to break away and, and have scenes and, and have him speak for himself. Uh, and, and to have audiences make up their own minds. Um, mm. You know, uh, also the case with, you know, with uh, antagonists, characters like Steve and his friends. Mm. Um, uh, you know, that's the exciting thing about adaptation. You can, you can build on a story and, and paint a, a, a different world. Mm. Mm. Well, there are some canine lovers out there that want to go down the um, uh, dog park line of questioning and the questions are absolutely fabulous but I'm going to be a very bossy host now and I'm going to say please keep the conversation going about Craig's books uh, about Honeybee we have a wonderful um, chat group Bendigo Writers Festival chat group that you can join you just hop onto the website uh, and take part in it and you can go on discussing this book all you like because we've only just scraped the surface and Craig it has been my absolute um, fangirl pleasure uh, to to talk to you about this really amazing book and I wish it all the success and I hope someday soon we get to see you over on this side of Australia because you are a treasure. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Sarah. I really appreciate that. And yes, I'd be delighted to, to head across to Benigo and be part of the festival and, uh, and, and meet everybody. Uh, it'd be wonderful to see everybody's faces and connect in person. Really look forward to that. Uh, but thank you for being so generous and for believing in the book and, and uh, supporting my career. It just means the world. And thank you, everybody, for tuning in tonight. Uh, really appreciate it.